I am so delighted and honoured to welcome to the stage this evening the three finest people you could have to deliver those insights into the six-year development period of Baldur's Gate 3. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, first of all, Sven Winker. I feel like Sven should really be on the throne, but, uh, <laughs> but here we are. Next up, writing director at Larian, it is Adam Smith, everyone. And last but very much not least, lead writer on Baldur's Gate 3, Crystal Ding, everyone. <laughs> All right, welcome, folks. Thanks for joining us here. It is a real privilege to have you back with BAFTA for this masterclass session. Uh, first of all, before we dive in, how does it feel being here at the, the sort of tail end of a very long victory lap? I'll let you go first. <laughs> uh, it's always emotional. Uh, we we have been 10 months since we released, uh, and it still feels like it was yesterday. This game changed our lives. Uh, it really did. Um, and uh, every time I think I'm done saying things about it, then something like this happens, and I think, I oh, know I want to talk about it all night again. Um, yeah, but it's very emotional for me. Yeah. Yeah, mixed. Uh, I, I want to move on. I want to make new things. Uh, but I'm super happy and super uh, appreciative of how people uh, appreciated uh, Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, so it's really uh, being here again, it brings back all the memories from the, the night at the BAFTAs, which was very emotional for the, our entire team. So yeah, yeah. Uh, happy, great. And, but also happy it's one of the last ones. <laughs> OK. Well, we're privileged that it is one of the last yeah. ones. Crystal, are you ready to talk some more about Baldur's Gate 3? You got it in you? Yeah, I've got, yeah, I've got it in me. I was th actually thinking when we were um, meeting the actors again earlier and just hearing their voices, like it just it took me back. And it's like it's something that, you know, uh, I've moved on from, but I'll never move on from. So. Nice. OK, well, speaking of taking you back, um, if you can cast your mind back, Sven, um, to 2014, let's say, we understand that it was it was a decade ago that um, Larry and set out to like with the intention to make a Baldur's Gate game. Casting your mind all the way back to that point, what was it that drew you to Baldur's Gate? Why were you so keen to make a Baldur's Gate game? Um, there were a couple of things. Uh, so I was feeling like we were hitting a, a, a glass ceiling with what we were doing. I didn't know at that time that Divinity Original Sin 2 was going to be the hit that it was going to be. And so, but I didn't know or I felt that it was going to be successful. So I wanted to move into the big, expansive AAA cinematic RPG because I thought that needed to be made. Nobody was doing them the way that we intended to make them. And so uh, that was going to be very expensive, very risky. Uh, so I said it will help if there's an IP uh, that's going to draw attention uh, to do it. So that was uh, the first one. Second one was uh, I knew there were a lot of people in the team that would be super motivated for it. And so after doing two original scenes, I said we need something fresh. Uh, so And then the third one was if we're going to do this big, expensive very large RPG, we're going to need a lot of people. So I need something that we can communicate to people that they instantly say yes. And so that's essentially what, what happened uh, once we started telling people uh, we're making Baldur's Gate. Okay. And how did it feel going into that sort of that legacy, that, that kind of an influential franchise? So that was the funny thing. It was because I didn't expect it was going to be so intimidating when the fir default first popped up. Uh, mm. But then I, the further we went, I said, oh, my God. <laughs> the <laughs> expectations for this thing are so high, so, so, so high. So we, we have to make sure that we do not disappoint. And so that actually started the drive of a big expansion for us uh, in terms of uh, making Larian the company that could make Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, so it was uh, certainly uh, the pressure was much higher than I ever expected when we came up with it because, you know, it's been 20 years who was still thinking of it. Yeah. Uh, so. Apparently some, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Adam and, and Crystal, what was your relationship to Baldur's Gate coming onto the project? Like, how did you feel about joining a, a game like that? So I have a, a bit of a strange one about this because I, um, I came to it through Larian, actually, in the early access. Mm. Um, I'd, I'd been a Larian fan. Like, I'd played Divinity Original Sin 2 with my partner and we'd kind of, you know, courted each other through the multiplayer fuckery we did on each other <laughs> <laughs> and so we were really really excited for Baldur's Gate 3 and then when the early access came out I was like yeah they're still they, they're still doing it and they're doing, doing cooler and cooler things and I'd always was like oh it's a pipe dream I'd love to I'd love to help them make that mm. and weirdly here we are <laughs> here we are I, I grew up with uh, Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 and I came on uh, early in uh, pre-production yeah still and um and I was sitting in San Francisco with Sven, uh, and he said, I want you to come work with me. 
And I said, what would, is it Divinity Original Sin 3? And he said, I can't tell you what it is. And he just signed an NDA first. Ah. And then he showed me a piece of paper and I signed it. He said, okay, it's Baldur's Gate 3. And I said, are you fucking joking? Because <laughs> 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 I immediately thought, well, that's a, <laughs> that's a hell of a thing. And I, but I, I thought if anyone can do it, then it's Larian. Uh, so I had the double weight. I was like, we've got the legacy of Baldur's Gate. And Larian was my favorite studio in the world. And I was like, you know, I don't want to be the one who comes on and then mm. things go wrong. So it was, it was very intimidating, but very quickly, as soon as I got to know the team, it was, it was the right team. And they, you know, was, you got confidence quickly. But it meant a lot to me. I mean, I love these characters. Um, love the ones we made, love the ones we brought back, and it was a world that meant a lot to me, yeah. A lot of pressure across the board then. Um, Sven, do you remember like, the moment when it became real, when you, you knew it was going to be a, a Baldur's Gate game that you were making? Was there a, a sort of pivotal moment for you? Um, well, I was of course saying yes. Yes. <laughs> that moment. How was that moment? Um, weird, because um, at that moment, uh, there was a change in, in uh, command at Wizards of the Coast. Mm -hmm. The new CEO had just come on board. Mm -hmm. And it was literally one of his first days when I met him. Uh, so it's like me coaching him through the process of being there <laughs> rather than vice versa. Uh, so we were still in the original Sin 2 mode. We're pretty much where we are now. Uh, but Baldur's Gate 3 was going to be the new game, mm. but it wasn't 100% real yet. It was, okay, we're going to make this game, but we have to go through a couple of milestones. We need to make a design document that they approve. So there was all these uh, opportunities for failure still waiting for us. So it's only when we really started, uh, we, we passed that final milestone before we actually went into production. I said, okay, now it's really happening. Mm. And, then it's like, and then I looked around and said, oh my God, there's going to be so much stuff that we have to do. Uh, but there's, there's I, I, because I've been around for some time, uh, I tend to assume that things are going to go wrong uh, so that I'm ready for it psychologically, emotionally. Uh, and um, when it started kicking into production, that's when it was real. And then when I started seeing how high expectations were, uh, because there were a couple of leaks, then it became really real. And then said, you better really don't fuck it up. Mm. <laughs> okay, to fast forward a little bit and, and talk about what I think some people would call the, the heart of the game. Let's talk about the companion characters. Uh, as you were approaching, like creating a, like, um, a diverse party, a diverse cast of characters, and you had certain stories that you wanted to tell with them, but at the same time, how did you marry the stories you wanted to tell with the, the needs of the gameplay? It's, it, it's all connected. So as soon as we, we had hundreds and hundreds of uh, like one-liners for characters, uh, so we'd go through them and we'd say, are they compatible? Do they overlap too much? You know, is, uh, are we gonna be repeating ourselves with the stories here? And do they fit the themes? Uh, that's the, that was the most important thing. And then, then you figure out what class do I need this person to be, both for balance and make sure the party's interesting and, and to support the story. Uh, but it was, it was a, a huge, huge list. Uh, and if you go back to those original uh, pitches, they're all still true. The, what, the, what, what was the heart of them stayed true, but everything else about them was open to change as they grew and they evolved. And, uh, and you know, the actors, some of whom you'll see later, when they came in, they changed the characters, mm -hmm. you know, because as soon as you get a voice to them, there would be six years on this thing, right? So the actors, for them, it was like returning for a season of a TV show sometimes. So you're coming back, we know what your character's been through now. So, so they helped to inform it as well. Um, but it, it, once you start to put them in the game and play them, then very quickly you, you figure out whether they're working or not. It never, uh, it never dictated what they needed to be from the gameplay side. We always had the freedom to, to do the character work, but at the same time, it has to feed back in. Um, mm. But it was really about that. It was making sure we didn't repeat ourselves with any of them uh, and that they thematically felt strong. I mean, if you, if you play the game, you can see the, the, the common ground that they have. You know, that was very important to us. You also need to make sure that there was room for them inside of the game. Yeah. So the world uh, changed continuously as mm. uh, the, the, our story creation process is fairly volatile. Uh, and it goes hand in hand actually with what's happening in the level design and with the game mechanics and how the flow of the game is. So uh, often you could see that stories of companions would change in function of what we saw. Oh, we could tell this story here, but we can't tell that story here. So we're going to have to change. So it's, it's a constant, uh, a process of things affecting one another mm. and eventually reaching some form of stability. Mm. So the genesis of a character wasn't, we need a rogue or... No, 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 no not no, at all. No, 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 actually the classes came last. Yeah. Uh, oh, wow. So, like, um, well, I mean, uh, we, we shared that, that the star used to be a tiefling. Yeah. Uh, but uh, likewise, uh, Dark Urge's base class has pretty much been everything at some point. Uh, so it was really later in the, in the process that we said, okay, well, we need to lock in certain classes that we want to be 
compatible with the player. Mm -hmm. Shadow Heart was always a cleric because we figured everybody was going to need a healer. <laughs> uh, so, right. Uh, <laughs> but that was probably uh, the only, and Astarian probably was always a rogue also, so that made a lot of sense for him. Uh, but for the other ones, I don't think, or I can't remember that we said like, okay, that's the one, that's that class. That's so interesting because you, you think of a D and D uh, class as almost having like a personality trope, yeah. but the fact that the class came uh, proceeded from the character itself is, yeah. is, is really fascinating. Well, we always need to leave room for the players, right? Mm -hmm. So there always needs to be room in that party for whoever the hell you guys want to be, uh, <laughs> and and if you don't have that, then it's you, you're the supporting character, and that can't be the case. They have to be the lead character. So, yeah. Yeah, and we also knew that they were going to be able to change it anyway. Uh, so, because for a long time we had a lot of discussions about what are we going to do? Are we going to let the character uh, change? Like, are we going to let players change their character? Because what are they going to talk about? Uh, mm. Because they have to talk about the fact that they're a cleric, for instance. And then we decided, you know what? I mean, they're going to be like a cleric in their head, but now they start a new job. Barbarian <laughs> Gale. <laughs> <laughs> Just fancy to change, you know? I don't yeah. want to heal anyone anymore. Um, we've actually got some concept art for Jahira versus the final release here. Could you speak to the difference and the Oh, that's a very long process. You're watching on the left side, you're seeing 2D artwork, and then people often think that the concept artist defines the entire look, but the 3D artist does as much work as the concept artist mm -hmm. does when they're modeling uh, the character. So there's a lot, and there's a lot of disciplines that come together in the creation of a, uh, of a character. So what you're seeing on the left side are exploratory pieces uh, as they're trying to figure out, okay, what is this character going to look like? But at the end of the day, really, it's going to be the 3D artist that's going to decide what the character will look like. I mean, you, you see there's a an enormous like, similarity there. Does anything jump out to you as like, I remember making this change? There was a vision that obviously, her being an established character didn't shift too much. Yeah. yeah. The one with the biggest changes was Kalak, I think, visually. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Kalak went for a lot. There was a version of Kalak in Early Access, which is a completely different character uh, visually. Uh, we had a lot of different concepts, and actually one of the last things that fell into place was the heart. Yeah. We didn't have the heart for a long time. It was uh, this person who did, was a fugitive from hell. I think that was the phrase. It was, yeah, I'm a fugitive from hell. Yeah. Uh, and and then at some point we were we were looking for the extra coolness and also what is the this character's what is the thing about them that we can interact with that we can uh, engage with and we 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 found this idea of the steampunk heart, the kind of hell heart. Uh, but yeah, for the longest time she didn't have it. And when you say to a lighting team and a cinematics team and a 3D <laughs> character team, by the way, she's now got a glowing metal heart in her chest. They go, okay, really? <laughs> it's a good Wednesday. <laughs> you, you have to realize that some of these changes were also inspired by semantics team. Says, we can't show that. We can't do anything with this mm. character. So you need to change this because otherwise, where do we put our camera? There's going to be too much clipping going on mm -hmm. and so forth. So there's really... It's uh, like many things about uh, pretty much everything about Baldur's Gate 3. It was teamwork that defined uh, what the characters this, like. this just reminds me of looking at this because um, Jahiro doing the entangling vines. Again, you talk to the cinematic team and animates and they say, you know that this character that she's entangling in vines can be a gnome, can be a half orc, yeah. can be a dragonborn. <laughs> yeah. And you go, yeah, but it's a good scene, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> I love that, that Karlak was like, by the way, this character is also a light source now. So if you can deal with that. Um, and, and also the feedback cycle of like, the heart came really late, but it's also, a, it, it's, it has a function in gameplay. Yeah. Like yeah. It, yeah. So there's this kind of like ongoing cycle. Yeah, and that's yeah. the collaboration. It's like, you know, you have a cool idea in narrative, and then the, the people on the art, art side, cinematic side, make it beautiful. And there was audio in there as well for Kalak. And, uh, and then gameplay systems look at it, and they say, actually, we can do something cool and make this even more unique. And it's great. Mm. Yeah. When, because we often talk about uh, iteration, and that's actually the iterative process. It's uh, feedback loops that are going back between the teams, mm. uh, ultimate all the way to the players, that then also inform change that's happening inside of the characters. Well, for us as players, I think we're, we're maybe just about now beginning to grasp the, the expansiveness of the branching paths and the, the player choice and, and just how much is going on like behind the scenes, like beneath the hood. Okay? Uh, hundreds of thousands of lines of dialogue and you know, hours of, of, um, of cinematic and, and whatnot. But how do you as writers, how do you begin to address like, these, uh, this variety of options like sitting perfectly alongside each other depending on, on which player chooses uh, which option. It's really which easy. It's a crystal. Yeah. <laughs> Difficulty! <laughs> That's definitely have, a crystal question. Do you have it all in your head? Is it? I think it's ended. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we had to... Um, I'll tell you a story. I remember uh, there was a moment towards the end where... Um, I said to one of the writers, um, uh, Sarah, who was here before, I said to her, um, oh, Sarah, could you just open this file and quickly have a look at Carlac's lines in here and see if this makes sense, what I've mapped out? 
And she went through and she was like, sure, sure, sure. And she came back and she sent me a video she'd recorded where she just dragged the screen around the file and around and around <laughs> and around and around and around and it kept just going. And, and she was like, this is the consequences of our choices and actions. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that's it, because um, you, don't, you don't want to limit that possibility. Mm. In fact, you want to, when, you've, when you have those, those characters which, with such rich stories, you want to go everywhere mm -hmm. with where those stories can go. Um, but, and then there comes a reckoning. Uh, <laughs> when somebody kind of sits at the end and go, well, how does this story end? And, and you can't figure out how the story ends until you've actually made the story play out all the way. And so mm. it can't really, you know, you can't plan for, and then we'll land in these three places. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I mean, the, pro the approach we took with the ending was you kind of go, well, what are, what are the feelings I need to feel at the end of this great adventure and where I'm the hero? And I need to feel this, and then I, I did this, this was my triumph, and then I felt this about it, and then I need this moment of closure, and I need this kind of moment of uh, reflection, and after that I need this moment of celebration. And you think, well, what, what is the kind of the, the bones of the, the scene flow that you need to give that experience? And then once we kind of laid that in, it was kind of going to each each origin writer, so the, the writers who attach to specific origin mm -hmm. characters and saying to them, okay, well, what, what do you need from this ending? What does your character need to do in order to land in a place that feels good for the player that spent, you know, hundreds of hours with them? Um, and then we'd, we'd build it and then we'd realize that, you know, Lazelle needs a dragon. And so we add in a dragon. <laughs> and then you think, like, hi, oh, we yeah. need a dragon now. Gail's yeah. got some god issues, so we're like, <laughs> we'll figure those out. <laughs> uh, and we, it, it kind of became this Franken monster of just mm. um, making sure that even when you give them that space and that moment to kind of really um, close off their story, you don't, it doesn't take away from anyone else's closure mm. as well. Um, and I have to shout out absolutely the, the, uh, the, the, the amount of testing, because it was, um, I, I feel like it's something that really, really came through to me at the end, that mm. there, were, there, was a, there was a group of people who, uh, there was people testing the entire game, but especially with the ending, I ju just today I found the spreadsheet where we kept track of this. And it's one of those where you just keep scrolling and scrolling and <laughs> scrolling of like every single path of like, what if I have... Carlac and Lizelle and Shadowheart. What if Shadowheart did this ending? What if uh, so and so did this ending? What if they did that ending? Um, and I just and it's like row after row after row, and it takes a small army to mm -hmm. kind of go through that and make sure because you're, you're picking up on the nuance of like, well, what if I went through this whole story? Does that line really make sense? Is that line going to give me the feeling that I want to feel after I've spent a hundred hours with this person, after I've fallen in love with them, and we've you know we've had a romance together and all of this, and you know saved the world or, or not? Um, so. Yeah, it's it's the devil's in the details. Like right. it's a, it's it's both a massive thing, but where you're scrutinising every small line to make sure the emotion lands where mm. you want it to be. Oh, sorry, I was going to say we had a song. That's how mad we went. <laughs> We'd look at the dialogue file, and it was just like there was a moment where it was like the Githyanki are leaving, Asterion's on fire, and it was just a whole <laughs> song where it was like these are the beats that we have to hit, and like where are they? Where are the Githyanki? <laughs> and then we said that wasn't enough. We'll do an epilogue. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I mean, I've got to say, release the song, uh, for one. That was it. <laughs> that really wasn't. Bobby wasn't on that one. <laughs> as, as I understand it, there's no sort of canonical, like, true story that, any, that is privileged above any other story in no. Baldur's Gate 3. Like, how do you, as writers, as, as creatives, kind of keep yourself from like, attaching to a certain story? Or, or maybe you do, and you just have to kind of leave that to one side. For me, I think it's different for everyone, probably. But for me, it was like, as soon as it's released, it belongs to everybody else. And okay. it's fun, they, you know, it's theirs, and they, they do what they will with it. And that includes the way they play it, includes the fan fiction, it includes the cosplay, it includes the artwork, some of the artwork. By <laughs> <laughs> That's not canonical. <laughs> 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 Uh, but it, but it's that it's really you you have to accept that the characters don't they're not yours they belong to the the player and uh, and fundamentally like I said earlier uh, and I say this a lot it's like a, a mantra for me is like the main character of the game is the person playing the game whether they're playing an origin or whether they're playing a tab you know custom character they have to be the main character so therefore that that's the canonical story and yeah. We, we always approach it as we are the dungeon masters, uh, so the players are going to define everything and we just have to anticipate what all these players want to do, which is impossible, of course, but we try to do as much as we could. And so the process was very much when, and this was throughout all of Larian, I want to do this and I can't do this, so let's just add this so that you can do it, mm. So because you're representing some part of the player population and they'll want to be able to do that. And like a really good uh, dungeon master, you can't be attached to a certain outcome or even a certain path to no, reach No, not at all. They, they feel it straight away if you try and push them. Yeah, they, they know. This is why we allow you to 
kill pretty much every single character in the game. We don't know who you want to kill, but you will want to kill someone. You yeah. have to assume that someone yeah. is going to want to kill everyone. It's Walbrun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you mentioned uh, early access. Baldur's Gate entered access, early access in, in, in 2020, obviously a, a really rather extended period in, a, in early access. Um, how important, I mean, I feel like very important, like how formative was the early access period for Baldur's Gate? Well, it was, first of all, much longer than I ever expected. Uh, so obviously there were attenuating circumstances happening around us in the world. Um, it's, it was complicated because we suddenly were a live service game with impatient fans that wanted more, and we didn't plan on giving them more because we wanted to finish and focus on games. So we had to balance those two things, and that caused quite a lot of stress within the studio. So, so dealing with that was, was really not the easiest thing uh, in the universe. But we, ma we managed eventually, we figured out uh, what our groove was going to be to finish this game and how to handle both updates and patches and at the same time focus on, 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 on finishing it. Uh, but the biggest thing that came out is obviously was um, it allowed us to uh, course correct. Mm -hmm. uh, there were mistakes that we were making and the players were telling us, this is a mistake, you shouldn't be doing this. We are say There's a hundred of us saying it now. In the future, it will be millions of us. So fix it now. And so and we listened. Uh, so we, we, we tried to listen and do as much as we can where we think it makes a lot of sense. And so that, I think, was instrumental in, in, in BG3's success. Uh, the, um, if we would have just said uh, from the get-go, here's the game, and we're off to an island, uh, it would have been a completely different story. Mm. Does, this, uh, does this concept part versus final release speak to early access versus final release? No, because that first one was, was kicked back. <laughs> ah. <laughs> no, no. So what you see on the right side mm. was actually very much how we envisioned it when we started out on it. But again, when you look at concept art, it's really exploratory. Mm. It's really... Um, when, when concept artists are doing something, they actually should not have any criticism. They should be free to do everything, explore the entire spectrum of, of the search tree, which, uh, or the creative search tree. And then eventually you say, okay, well, let's go in that direction. And so then it starts narrowing down. But that one that you see on the right side is actually very close to the concept art that came out of the concepting phase. Right. Uh, as, as writers and, and, and creatives, when you get such a vast wealth of feedback as you get in an early access phase, um, how do you know what to, what to pay attention to and what is perhaps not so vital? Like, or is every, does everything need to be treated with equal weight? S so you, a lot of it is on gut feeling. Mm. Uh, so we have analytics, we have uh, quantitative measures where we can see, okay, many players are dying here, so we're, we'll adjust a number of things. But at the end of the day, it's really, how do I feel like a player about the game? Uh, and so, and you make pretty much, uh, I think if you do it any other way, you will just be paralyzed. You won't be able to do anything. Uh, if you're gonna try to do it by committee, uh, and then it's just going to be the most mediocre of things that you can have. So you have to follow your gut and say, what game do you want to play? And then, and then it actually comes very easy. Uh, and then you just have to hope that that's the game that other people want to play also. Okay. Usually if somebody's saying something, then somebody in the studio has already said it, mm. is often the case. You know, it reinforces things that people are already feeling. Um, the great advantage of early access is getting eyes on it that aren't too close to it as well. Um, one of Sven's superpowers is uh, that he's very good at pretending to be that person. Uh, it's true. He's very good at pretending amnesia. not to know things. <laughs> uh, but uh, but that, that thing of people looking at it, and especially as a writer, uh, you, you think, you know, well, this all makes perfect sense and they can follow the flow. And then someone plays it and you see them just blank and they're just like, what, is, what, what am I supposed to do next? What, what, what did this person want from me? And you go, oh, my God, it was already clear yeah. in my mind. And, and if it's not, then you go back and you start it, you try again. Uh, but it's that it's losing clarity is often the thing. It's like it's not the it's not the character moments, the emotional moments. Those you you kind of feel yourself, but you, you can very easily lose people um, yeah. just by overcomplicating. Mm. You also have to take into account there are many many people in the universe with many 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 opinions. Uh, so it's impossible to cater to everyone. Uh, and so you don't necessarily always have to listen to the majority if you really believe in what's inside of the game. Mm. Uh, but when the majority is like complaining about a mechanic or about not being able to do something, then you'd better listen because that means there's something broken inside of the game. Sure. I, I mean, it sounds like a lot of the things that came out of early access might have you know, arisen like, internally in the team before early access came along. Were there surprises that came out of the early access period? Can you speak about any of those? 
Yeah, there were quite a few. Yeah. Uh, so we fought Shadowheart in the beginning mm -hmm. when she was very sassy. Uh, she was great because we wanted to, our, our, our main thing was we we're going to create a party of people who distrust each other and then they're going to grow to trust each other. But maybe we dialed a little bit much to, uh, <laughs> to the left. Although, uh, to, to her credit, Sarah had flagged it. She said, yeah, like, I really don't like Shadowheart. <laughs> wow. So she was more sassy originally. This yeah. is like dialed down sassy is what we got after launch. Heavily dialed down. Okay, <laughs> yeah. all right. Yeah. This isn't early access, but right before release, we made everyone too horny. Uh, <laughs> that's the natural thing no. that happened. We were testing the romances. No, we shipped we, that. Yeah, we did. We shipped <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we were like, you know, we were testing the romances. And we we're like, you know, like uh, we get to act two, and it's like no one's interested in me. It turns out we're probably just very bad at seducing people. So yeah. we dialed up the numbers and said, let's make the form, and then we shipped it. No, we actually, <laughs> it was actually booked. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. it was uh, it was bugged, and so we sort of started seeing all these reviews and people saying, "Does it really have to be this horny?" <laughs> no, that was not the intention. <laughs> Someone slipped and like turned this dial uh, no, by no, accident, the, and then the, we shipped the game. Uh, because the, I remember the script is saying, "I don't think it's working." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, is early access the future of game development? Is it for everyone? Is it for very specific titles? <sighs> I, I don't like the future off because you never know what mm. the future will bring. This, for us, it's been really good. I heartily recommend it. I, but you, sh you really have to mean it when you go in there. You have to work with the players uh, and making your game better. Otherwise, you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, and so that means that you need to take the time for it also. If you are only in early access for a month or so, mm. that's fine too. But then it's probably just to test some technical things and you have to be open about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, um, I think it's great. Yeah. Can you recommend four years of early access? <laughs> <laughs> My team is watching. <laughs> uh, so, uh, no, it's long. Uh, it's actually quite long, I think. And player bases do get that tired also. I mean, like, uh, we got tired of early access. Uh, sure. So, uh, but sometimes it happens, you know. If, if something is not working, uh, the day of release, that's your last chance that you get to release a game. So if you release it with something that is broken, you know it's broken, I really don't advise releasing it because if you do that, then players are going to say it's broken. I mean, and there goes all the chances for the game. So I, I really would wait if you can. Mm. Any other words of wisdom for, for game makers considering early access? I mean, for us, it was fantastic. I think it, it has to fit the game as well, obviously. So uh, mm. different for different people. I'm playing Hades 2 at the moment, and they're fantastic at early access as well. But I think it is a, it, there's an art to early access. Because uh, uh, what Sven said earlier, um, you've sold someone a game. They paid for the game. So you do need to maintain it, and you owe them that. You know, you can't just say, OK, that early access branch is now over here, and we're over here, and it's neglected. You can't do that. Uh, so, so that that's a lot of effort. Um, you know, it's it's it, it's difficult. It's also, I will say, that release day is a lot easier when you have already fans of a game. Like, uh, you know that you've got something that people have enjoyed. You know you could still, you know, screw up the rest of it. But uh, but it does put you in a place where you 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 know there's a solid base there at least. Hopefully, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, you really shouldn't approach it with the attitude, oh, it's just early access. Yeah. Uh, cool. It's like there's players playing this that care, uh, so you should treat them uh, with respect. All right. A, a question now that uh, creatives in the audience might be able to identify with, sympathize with. As writers, as, as creators, how do you know when you've finished something? When, a piece of work, maybe not the work entire, but a piece of work. When do you know it's time to step away, stop tweaking, adjusting, refining, polishing? Or, or, or do you not know when that comes? When people come and find you and they're very angry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. but, uh, I mean, more seriously, I think, mm. um, the, well, firstly, you, you've got the, the big grand narrative and you want to get that right. And, and that seems, you know, that's the obvious thing you have to do. But then you've got, okay, what are all those meaningful little moments where if we don't get them right, people are going to really feel it and it's not going to, it's not going to feel right to them when they get there. And so you've got to look after those. And then you start, you start thinking, okay, well, but I'm discovering more and more of those and I, I don't want people to run into those and feel bad. I want them to get the feeling that they were looking for when they went there and did that thing that took them a lot of effort that was really um, interesting to them. And they wanted that, you know, that nugget of reward at the end. So you're trying to take care of all of those things and you just keep finding more and more things. But I think there did, there did come a point, and for me it was when um, there was a particular um, relatively small thing and we made a relatively small, what we thought was a relatively small change. Oh, after launch. Yeah, yeah, after launch. Yeah. And then the community were like, why, why did they change that? And, and then suddenly I had that, I think, I mean, I should have had the realization earlier, but in that moment it was really, really clear to me. It's like there is a point now where this belongs to them and you need to stop 
you stop messing with it now because people they've they've built their stories they've spent the time having their own narratives that they've created is theirs that's that's when you leave it mm. let it let it be the players stories is it hard to let go do you consider yourselves like perfectionists is it difficult to kind of just let it go i think in the in the f certainly the first weeks after release i think i woke up and went to bed looking at reddit trying to figure out what were still the things that weren't working, like what's, <laughs> uh, what did we miss, what, did, what, you know, what worked well, what didn't work well, just constant this hunting of this kind of, um, just not wanting anyone to have a bad moment when yeah. you know that you could, you could give them the moment that was right. Um, but then eventually you just, you, you, that tale has to go. <laughs> yeah, it's hard like super serving, personally serving everyone you're gonna read about on Reddit, right? Yeah. So. So we, we had uh, groups that were reviewing the game. And so when uh, we shared stories at the end of every day, like, what, how was your run? How was your run? And there came a moment where I said, like, it felt good. And that's the moment to stop. When everybody started saying, it feels good, I really had a good time. And even if they played it like over and over and over, I think that was the, there were still small things that were not okay. But I mean, <coughs> you knew there, okay, if everybody's feeling good about it, and it's again, that gut feeling thing, right? So we're all players of games. So uh, we know games. Once that's there, I think that's the moment that you can say, okay, we're, we're there. Mm -mm. But th there was also times that I remember very strongly where you'd had a really positive response to something internally inside the studio where people were like, oh, this is really cool. They really enjoyed it. And then one person uh, would come and they'd play it and they'd go, hmm. And you go, oh, <laughs> shit. And, uh, and you ask them, what was it? And it's usually something that you did. As a writer, it's usually I didn't have the option that I wanted. I couldn't do what I wanted. This mm -hmm. doesn't f represent my character. And you crack it open and you go back because that, that you can't, you can't, I mean, you do ship things like that because you can't catch every single one, but oh, it's, it's, it's really painful. But then when you bring them back over and you say, try it again, and they go, ha, ah, it's, it's, it's the best feeling in the world. Yeah. Well, we added a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot, yeah. We did a lot of just going through the game at the end and just, just doing that. Just like, a, and it's not a polished pass. It was literally like, you know, where do we put in the extra bits here to make sure that, uh, yeah, to make sure people feel represented, to make sure that uh, they're, they're getting the character they want uh, a lot, yeah. And I mean, in terms of like serving your community, serving your players, like that hasn't quite ended. You've still got ongoing support and you've got like a patch coming like later on. Does that, is that something that, uh, that you kind of factor into that? Like we've got to keep serving people and keep giving them all of these, these things that, that will complete their experience. Well, it's super important, right? So players gave us the opportunity to make the games that we're making. So we need to make sure that uh, the game does what it's supposed to do, which is work. And we try to improve their quality of life as, as much as possible. Uh, one of the big things for us, and uh, the one that we're really working towards now, is the ability for players to mod it themselves, because then they will be starting to have their own ecosystem, and they can, I, I, I can't believe I said ecosystem, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but that they, they will be able to, to make their own things, and I think that will be the point where we're going to say, okay, now it's yours, fully. Uh, so, uh, but we're not there yet. So we're very much hard, hard trying to make that work actually. Um, so, but I think then you will see the, the level of support diminish to really critical bug fixes, uh, mm. that kind of thing. Uh, but at this point, we're still working as if the game was just out. But you're, are you looking forward, looking ahead to this like final handover moment? Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, uh, we're working on our new thing. So we're super sure. excited about the new games. Uh, and we really want to, uh, like, because uh, I was talking to Bobby uh, and he said, oh, this is, feels like closure again. <laughs> 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 so I want to I wanna start on new stuff. Uh, and so that it's really important uh, for we're creative spirits also. So we don't want to keep on doing the same thing. We really want to move forward and do new things. Okay. Uh, Baldur's Gate had a, an epic six year like journey to launch, like just a, a really marathon uh, development cycle. Uh, you've sp spoken before about um, avoiding crunch, avoiding that kind of like, like intense pressure uh, uh, to, to perhaps overwork. How, how did you approach that? How do you avoid that? Well, we didn't fully avoid it. I mean, we did have our moments where things were completely wrong. Um, for a long, long time, what we did is we added people because we could. Uh, so we, we tried to match our ambitions by adding extra people and then for a long time we delayed things because we could. Uh, so those were the first easiest ones to do. But at a certain point in time we had to start releasing things and then it became about being able to uh, dashboard our velocities really. Uh, how much work can we actually do 
and then um, we, we weren't 100% accurate with that, uh, but it did save a lot of things because we were able to predict this is going to work out, this we can't do anymore, we need to find other solutions. Uh, where crunch comes into play is typically when it goes completely wrong, mm -hmm. uh, and so and something always goes wrong. Uh, you never know what it's going to be. It can be your build servers that break. Uh, it can be uh, actors that get really sick. Uh, it can be uh, people that get sick on the team and they're in the bottleneck position. So you never know up front what it's going to be. And so we did certainly have overtime, uh, but we we tried to minimize it. It was very rare to see people uh, in a weekend, uh, and if they were there, it was going to be a really very very small crew. Um, but during the week and in the last months, especially when we moved the release date forward, we certainly did have to do a, a bit of it. It feels like in the discourse around crunch, there's actually different kinds of, of yeah. crunch. And from what you're saying, it sounds like s some specific kinds of it just aren't going to be completely avoidable in developing a game. Well, it's paid over time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really, uh, it's not counting on it also. I think that's the main important bit, right? You, you, you can't count on it. You need to try to predict, try to adapt. Um, but I think in any creative industry, uh, you know, if you if the news needs to go out at seven o'clock and something goes wrong, people are going to do stuff to make sure that the news goes out at seven o'clock. Uh, it's the same thing for us. Once the release date is locked in and all the marketing agreements are in place, uh, you really push hard to make it, uh, and uh, you have tools at your disposal. Uh, can you outsource it? Outsource it. Can you fix it by scaling up? Scale it up. Can you fix it by reducing it? Reduce it. And the last one is like, okay, we need to do extra extra work. Mm -hmm. uh, and and even there, you can still like uh, um, uh, modulate it. The other bit that we had, and this is an advantage unique uh, to Larian, and mm. there's not that many developers that can do this. We have a um, we have studios across the world, so we can pass work over to someone else. So a producer, who's typically the last one in the waterfall, who needs to press the build server button or whatever, uh, he doesn't have to wait until the middle of the night for someone else who's ready. Uh, he can just pass it on to, hey, Quebec, can you take over? Or hey, Kuala Lumpur, can you take over? And we did that a lot, uh, and that's that's a powerful tool to have. Six years is, is an enormously long time to be working on a project. Not everyone was there for the entire six years, but some were. How did you keep everyone motivated for, for that length of time? Why well, the game? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's really that. People were really excited about the game. I mean, the, um, they, they really cared. There were moments, there were slumps, typically when the game was not working at all, and every single day you started up and everything broke. Uh, but uh, first there was a the game, then there was a the player community once it went into early access, because then you started having the players. Uh, and you can rest assured we read all those reviews. Like uh, what Crystal said is literally, I mean, everybody was in their bed like just... <laughs> <laughs> and then the next day everybody was, sorry, I've seen that. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, oh, what are they thinking? And uh, the, so, um, players. Yeah, so this is a company, uh, it sounds really cheesy, but it's really by players for players. So this is our, our, our prime uh, directive, if you want. Mm. Uh, uh, so, um, But we would like to be able to do a shorter cycle. The problem with this game was it just needed the time. Mm. Right? So it needed the time. We had the war in Ukraine, forces to close the studio, you had COVID. All those things together, they conspired against what was already a very complicated game to make. Yeah. I love that. I don't think that's cheesy at all, by the way. I think that's beautiful, and I love that. It's and cheesy if it's not true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly so. Yeah. Exactly so. Uh, we are running short on time, so I have one final question. Um, probably the most challenging of the evening. What is your favorite class and race to play, and how would you describe your preferred alignment in Dungeons & Dragons terms? Drow monk. <laughs> cool. Uh, chaotic good. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Uh, tiefling Paladin. Uh, I, I think, I, what am I, Crystal? Chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> chaotic, chaotic, somehow. <laughs> I'm just chaotic. Uh, uh, I would be, uh, I guess, uh, Sorcerer, uh, Wild Magic, uh, Dragonborn, Dark Urge. Uh, chaotic Ooh. Evil. <laughs> oh, okay. Strong audience reaction yeah. to that one. Okay, well, that's all we've got time for, but thank you so much for being here. Thank it's been you. such a privilege. Um, everyone, would you please join me in thanking these wonderful people for this panel this evening? <laughs>